middle kid is just a control kid. This is the kid that's in your class, drops a pencil, say, Bobby, pick that up. Oh, God, I hate this. <laughs> uh, what time is it? Oh, they don't do that anymore. Like, oh, they, what do they do? Phone? Okay. Yeah. So this is called epigenetics. It's only about 15 years old that they know this. So epigenetics means the genes express depending on the environment that they grow in. Okay? And it's just mechanical. No blood or thing, nothing goes here, so it doesn't grow. Here's another kind of boilerplate lesson plan that they, uh, that, you know, neuroscientists used to teach you this, okay? This kid's 10 years old. The blue stuff means adulthood, okay? And so this is like 10 years old, this is 15. Uh, this is fully almost adult. Uh, what age is that for a female on average if they don't do drugs and alcohol? It's about 20. It can be 18 to 20. They do drugs and alcohol, it's farther along. Should I ask about men? <laughs> 45. <laughs> 47. I just did this at Weaver State, which is in Utah, and these are really, you know, professors are very, you know, serious. <laughs> this woman goes, my father is 85 and he's still 15. <laughs> <laughs> so with males, it's about 25-ish if they don't do drugs and alcohol. Males are more likely to do drugs and alcohol than females on average, but my point is, not only is it what you put in your system that slows down adulthood, it's the environment. If the child that I just showed you is really stuck here, even though he's 25, because he's been mistreated, if he goes to a place that nurtures and loves him, he'll get better. Uh, Larry Brentro is really a famous uh, psychologist. He's done a lot of work in Hawaii where there's in extreme poverty, which is kind of ironic if you ever go there. The North Shore of the Big Island is just, it's horrible. I've, I, I've tra trained over there. One grandmother taking care of 19 children, and she has to go to the South to work in the resorts and be there all day and come back, and they have no supervision. And so he followed a lot of kids like that from 15 to 30. He looked at everything from income to whatever, intelligence, all these other things. The one thing that stood out dramatically whether they made it to functional adulthood was if they had one person who cared for them over time regardless of their looks, their intelligence, or their behavior. Like just hanging in there with them, okay? So resiliency comes and grit comes from another person. People go, how do you get grit? Well, it's up to them. If they don't have it, you have to mirror it at them, okay? Okay, this is Mike Neese. He's one of my mentors. Uh, when I first put his slide in this, I could not talk about him. I'd start crying because he meant so much to me. I had just started staff developing with adults, you know, like 80 people in the room, all adults, many of them older than I am, and I just felt really insecure. And he came up to me one time. I was talking to somebody about this. He overheard me, and he goes, I just want to tell you something. When, that, when your talk starts going after the relationship thing and you have all that stuff about Larry Brentro and that stuff, he says, that is not heard. I don't hear this anywhere. I go, you're a world-class educator. <laughs> what did I want to do after that? I wanted to be a world-class educator, and I worked really hard to prove that to him. I still am. He's nowhere near me right now. <clears throat> this is another one, Michelle Mullen. I worked with her a lot uh, working with EL students in AVID, she lived in her car for two years of high school, right? She persisted, now she's a senior executive vice president of AVID, and she probably knows, I'll just say this, she knows more than anybody else, in, as far as the leadership, about learning and education than any of them. And so, uh, another person I just see as a, as a mentor that keeps me going. And then there's the other direction, okay? So I had this kid, Larry Verdugo. When I got him, he had tattoos on both forearms, huge letters, uh, Mexican pride. And uh, I don't know a, a more alpha male I've ever met, right? His mother had just died a year before I got him from drug-related kidney disease, and his dad had just gone to jail two weeks before 
He was living with his aunt Carol in a motor mobile home. He and his brother used to sneak out at night and go do bad things. He stole stuff from teachers. I really tried to find those things, but he was so dang clever. <laughs> he could run and jump up on my uh, uh, those temporary classrooms. He could run. He'd just put one foot on the wall and flip himself up onto the ceiling, uh, onto the roof, right? Uh, he'd use the, the staplers and Uzi, pull his pants down. Uh, what else? Uh, just any number of things. He was just an incredible human being in <laughs> all the... <laughs> Right? So I struggled with him for a year and three quarters. I told him I would never give up on him because that was my belief as a teacher. Yet in those two years, I know I, before I went to school, I threw up at least three times because I was in such despair as to what to do with this kid plus all the others that were in that class. I had my friend psychologist come in the room and help me. And guess what he did? He goes, I don't know. I feel a lot of fear when I come in this room. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. And then I had another teacher I knew was good with at-risk kids. He came and he says, I don't know what, there's just too many of them in one class. And I says, and he goes, especially that one. He was pointing at Larry. <laughs> so my Catholic conscience, I got him a job because I kicked him out. I got him a job at a supermarket. And I gave him my phone number. Don't do that. <laughs> and um, so I, I didn't hear from him. Uh, finally, I went into Albertsons of his supermarket. And I asked, is Larry still? No, no, I fired him. I go, why? Wow, he stares at me weird. <laughs> he was mad dogging the boss, you know. And so uh, he lost that job. And so I kept looking in the newspaper back in the day and looking in the obituaries and also looking in Spring Valley News. Is there any, any drug bus or anything like that? And I really troubled over it because I felt like I failed completely. Like I didn't do, I just didn't do it, right? A couple years later, during my prep period, thank God, because no one's in the room, I get an email that says, Hi, I'm Carol, Larry Verdugo's aunt. I don't know if you remember him. <laughs> 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 yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, she says, he's graduating from the police academy, and he says it's because of you he wants you to attend. <laughs> Well, the neat thing was, I, within a year of that, I got hired as a VP at an inner city school, downtown San Diego. 99% of the students were free and reduced lunch, and 99% were Latino. I had five Larrys in that year. Oppositional defiant disorders, all this stuff. It was easy. I really mean it was easy. I did not know I'd gained so many different skills that are like unnameable. They just come because your brain is never not learning. All that misery I went through, and by the way, the misery you feel when you're really troubling over something on the weekend, relationally or with a kid, it's because your brain is struggling like mad to answer it, and basically it takes three, two uh, quarter of your blood, and all the hormones come cascading out of your brain because it uses a lot of energy, makes you feel weak. That suffering is actually a sign that you're coming up with a new complex answer. And it's in areas that are organically complex like relationships that your brain struggles the most and actually comes up with the best answers over time. I didn't know any of this when this was happening. I just thought I went through hell. So I go to his graduation. This is a picture I took of him at Grossmont College. And I go, and I said, Larry, what? The, what? How did you do this? And he goes, you never gave up on me. That was four years before, a year and a half of me just, you know, I want to light you on fire, but I'm going to love you in the best way I possibly can, <laughs> made, him, made him realize he was worthwhile enough to struggle, right? And I don't want this to be an emphasis of, you know, Bill Matting and his St. Francis and he tames wild animals. <laughs> As, well, a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> most is that I had to struggle and hurt and hang in the battle before I had some really good skills to deal with the next group in a way that made me feel powerful and really effective. I actually was happy. I was going, man, I could deal with these kids now, <laughs> you know, and it's because these there's a million little skills. I don't even know what to name them about what to do when you have an extreme oppositional defiant kid who doesn't have any role models. So <clears throat> anyway, that's Larry.
It's something I want teachers to trouble over how to best actually uh, inspire students to be intentional about making that effort. Um, a lot of it comes through praise, and I think in this last session I didn't talk about praise, but the idea that when you praise somebody, you're very specific, and you talk about their process that they use, not the product, not, oh, you got an A, you're a great kid, that doesn't work. You have to say, okay, you struggled, you gave up a few times, then I saw you really dig your nose in, you worked hard, and you got a B. That's amazing. The struggle is what I was really proud of. When you put the praise to specific actions and processes that the kid engaged with, that's when they're, you're reinforcing the, the right behavior to get smart. So it's not about being smart. Praising an A gets you nothing. It's about praising the process that gets to the A.